Good morning, distinguished panelists, my co-organizers in the LSA, NSA, and Professor Kome. Uh, welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. My name is Siri Lubi, and I warmly welcome you of this Dr. Ob, can you uh, uh, regularize your uh, internet? Let's go on to Lagos Studies and then you can come back to us. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for making time to attend this webinar. Uh, my name is Sahid Adirito. I'm the president of the Lagos Studies Association and a professor of history at Western Carolina University. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third webinar in the series of four that we're having. Uh, the Lagos Studies Association is an organization of scholars and practitioners interested in Lagos, Nigeria, and Africa at large. On a yearly basis, we organize a conference. The last edition of our conference featured 120 panels and more than 600 presenters over five days. The next edition of the LSA conference will hold in, Lag in Lagos, Highbridge, and virtually next year from June 24th to June 25th. We're committed to a series of programs aimed at increasing intellectual feasibility for Nigeria and Africa-based scholars, as, as well as providing the best resources for professional development of everyone. And this uh, webinar is very important, not only because it focuses on the perspectives of Nigeria-based non-academic civil society leaders and uh, activists, but also because it allows us to look at the ways in which collaborations can exist across location and across uh, interest. So thank you so much for attending and I look forward to an interesting conversation. Okay, good morning everyone and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. My name is Chika Okoye and um, my area of specialization is global affairs. My, my research interests include the political economy of women in general, market women in particular. I'm the vice president of the Nigerian Studies Association. And the Nigerian Studies Association is an affiliate of the African Studies Association. We are a scholarly nonprofit professional organization committed to the promotion of interdisciplinary Nigerian studies. We welcome mm -hmm. you today to this very important webinar as we explore the incidents of gendered violence in Nigeria in particular, but this is going to be a series of webinars. So we're going to explore um, this phenomena in West Africa and in Africa in general. So welcome, and we hope that you get a lot of knowledge and good information from this webinar. Okay, good uh, morning, afternoon and evening. It's a uh, pleasure to see our panelists. And I'm expectant about the presence of the other two. Um, <clears throat> this set of webinars we're doing is deliberately designed to showcase Nigerian women's brilliance and their thoughtful approaches to um, looking at the problems and challenges that bedevil our country and also proposing solutions that are policy relevant. And, um, you know, the work they're doing, each and every one of them is inspiring. So we deliberately decided to feature women, <clears throat> especially because every time people are discussing important things in Nigeria, it's men's voices that we hear. And I think it is about time we talked that um, discrimination because our women have always been, um, been thoughtful, they've been hardworking, they have proposed solution and they're doing important work. 
to meet the challenges that our dear countries, I mean, our dear country has faced. So I am really um, overjoyed to see each and every one of you. Um, Dr. Obi, over to you. You're muted. Well, I apologize that um, uh, I'm having uh, issues with my Wi-Fi, but I hope you can hear me this time. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will just follow the lead of my co-organizers by welcoming this distinguished um, audience and also thanking the distinguished panelists for coming to this meeting. Uh, this webinar, as you all know, is about insurgency, banditry, and human security in West Africa. We are starting the series by focusing on Nigeria. Yesterday, we had very robust and exciting discussions on trends in violence and insurgency. And this morning, we shall be focusing on banditry and abductions. Just to introduce myself, I'm Cyril B. I'm a program director at the Social Science Research Council, and I lead two Africa-specific programs. One called Africa Peace Building Network, which is co-organizing this meeting and the other called Next Generation Social Sciences in Africa. APN supports postdoctoral research and supports practitioners to do research on peace building in African countries, while Next Gen supports PhD students to complete their PhD thesis. Uh, we do this through a series of fellowships, trainings, and networking activities. And I will actually invite you to visit our homepage because we are accepting proposals and applications for those fellowships. Um, it's also my responsibility to also thank uh, our moderator, and we really look forward to very robust discussions. I hope that more people will join us in the course of the deliberations and um, really look forward to uh, consolidating what started yesterday. This has been a really very, very enriching experience as a webinar, and um, I won't take any more time. I'll just hand it over back to Rita to lead us for the rest of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruby. In the state of Zamfara alone, between 2011 and 2019, over 6,000 people were killed by bandits. More than 3,500 individuals were kidnapped by bandits and roughly 500 villages were razed or burned to the ground by bandits. In the first half of this year, over 2,300 individuals have been abducted in Nigeria. Over 500 students were also kidnapped by bandits in Northwest Nigeria during the first half of this year. Nigeria does indeed have a problem of banditry and abduction that is of gargantuan proportions. Put differently, our people, we get problem. Hello everyone, and welcome to our session on banditry and insurgency. My name is Rita Ofieli, and I will be facilitating discussions among our very distinguished and much accomplished panel members who will share their knowledge and perspectives on banditry in Nigeria. Panelists will draw on their expertise and experiences to discuss the political, religious, socioeconomic implications of banditry and abductions with a very nuanced focus on the lives of girls and women. Before we start, some panel and audience, audience logistics. I will introduce each panel member before their presentation. After all panelists have presented, we will then take questions or comments from the audience. Meanwhile, during presentations, please use the Zoom, chat, and the Q&A freely for comments and questions respectively. I will not be summarizing the points made by each panelist after their presentation, but we'll quickly transition to the next speaker so as to maximize time at the end for questions from the audience. Key points made by panelists are mostly noted in the Zoom chat by Dr. Funke, so I will not take up more time with summaries. 
So moving things right along, our first speaker is Dr. Bolu Honor Bolu. Dr. Bolu is a gender and human rights activist who uses equitable access to water supply, sanitation and hygiene as an entry point to human rights and security. She has a master's degree in public health, postgraduate diploma in epidemiology and a doctorate in water resources. Her career spans academia, the UN and international and national NGOs in parts of Africa and Asia. Her work as the project manager of a multi-million dollar UNICEF sanitation and hygiene project led to safe and secure access to water and sanitation infrastructure for vulnerable women and girls in beneficiary community. Dr. Bolu is passionate about youth and women empowerment and is the convener of Mothers United and Mobilized, a governance focused coalition of Nigerian women. Dr. Bolu will discuss root causes and drivers of banditry and abductions in Nigeria. She will also touch on potential drivers of transformation, social justice, and peace. Dr. Onabolu, I will turn the mic over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. I would actually need um, permission to share my screen. Yeah, yes, and, you can you can do so now. Okay, okay. So whilst I'm doing that, I would like to to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to listen to other women's perspectives and to share mine as well, and for um, organizing this very timely and topical issue. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, Professor Mujubwaolu Okome, particularly. I will be addressing this topic um, in a way that I've titled it, Addressing the Enemy Within. And um, as the moderator mentioned, we have, we get problem and I've just um, taken some definitions there, but I'd like to do it the Nigerian way, and I just turn a couple of things. A friend of mine was regaling how someone was accosted by armed robbers, and the person, when he discovered that they were armed robbers, and not bandits or terrorists said, oh, ah, now you armed robber, where have you been all this while? It is a challenge, a terrible challenge, um, the issues of organized crime and insurgency, which is responding to certain things within our environment. The GSEF, which is the Global Engagement um, Fund, which is funded by the Swiss, they work in Nigeria on insecurity. And they use engagement and have come up with a framework that tries to, to look at and map the drivers for why certain um, members of our population are vulnerable and susceptible to recruitment um, within this organized crime and insurgency. And they have looked at issues which I would relate to human security, grouping it under environmental fragility, social structure instability, which includes access or um, inadequate access to social and amenities, which I'll be focusing on, displacements, and also the kinds of information sources that they have. The UNDP actually links human security 
very, very well as a prerequisite to national security, saying that freedom from want and freedom from fear for everyone is the best path to tackle the problem of global insecurity. You would see some pictures there. These are not pictures from um, 1960. These are pictures from Abuja and um, FCT in 2020 that was taken on a project that I worked on. In terms of um, human security, it also has been grouped into what many of us are familiar with, seven elements, the economic, the environmental, the social, the political um, security. Each one of this is necessary and important. And without any of this, we cannot have human security and we cannot have national security. And I will be bold enough to say, and I'm backed by evidence that none of these aspects of security can be achieved without water security. Okay, and then just to define water security, um, it's been defined in my sector as the availability, the reliable availability of water in sufficient quantity and quality to meet the needs for livelihoods, health, education, poverty reduction. And um, this cotton, which was taken just a few days ago, um, of an announcement by the NCDC director actually brings to bear the importance of water security. It would you know, surprise many to realize that cholera has killed more Nigerians than COVID-19 in 2021. Cholera is a waterborne disease. So the pathways, water security, and then water insecurity. There are three dominant pathways to water insecurity. It's diminished water supply or water quality, increased water demand due to unregulated industrialization, agri production, extreme events of flooding due to the climate change. And to bring it closer to Nigeria, all of these three pathways are are risk factors occurring in Nigeria. For example, in terms of quality, water quality, only 22% of Nigerians, you can please um, trans transform that into the millions, only 22% of Nigerians have water that is considered to be safe in terms of quality. 30% of Nigerians do not have what we consider as basic water, um, drinking water. So these water um, risk pathways that we experience in Nigeria then causes, has its effects, which include the issues of conflict. We all have heard that the next world war will be fought over water, displacements, people searching for water, safety challenges, many women are, cost, are accosted, raped when they um, as they look for water. And then the issues of disenfranchisement, where youth are not able to get water. I'll show some pictures that bring this closer to home. Exclusion out of school children because of the effect, the negative effect of inadequate access to water and sanitation on education, morbidity and mo mo mortality, and all of this make people vulnerable to um, being recruited into some of these issues of banditry insurgents. Not that I'm making an excuse for it, but these are some of the realities. Um, I attempt to, to compare um, Nigeria's access to water with Sub-Saharan Africa North Africa and Europe and North America. 
So just to quickly give you some figures, just checking my time here, just to quickly um, give you some figures, in Nigeria, only 7% of the health facilities have adequate access to water and sanitation. The impact of that is there. The number of cases um, in diarrhea, in terms of schools, only 14%. The impact is there. Three days lost per diarrheal episode. The youth unemployment um, rate right now is in 2021 is 53.4%. This picture that you see there is what's taken in Abuja, and these are youth searching for water. Um, 4.9 billion hours are spent looking for water, and this is a gendered issue. 30% of Nigerian, Nigerians um, have to go further than 30 minutes to look for water. This is about water insecurity and its contributions to human security. However, water security is able to contribute to virtually every sector in terms of um, the savings in health, the, the school attendance gained, where we then have people who are properly educated, although that's not the only issue, in terms of um, quality education in our country, then the value of productive days gained for the youths aged between 15 to 49 is there, is $21 million per annum. And then the value of time saved when water is brought closer um, to the homestead. I would like to say that studies also have shown that diarrhea, which we sometimes minimize, actually, um, in, when the episodes are repetitive, it affects cognitive development, and that is having um, an effect on the mental development of our future labor force. This has been documented. These are some of the pictures taken in 2020 this is a child going with his mother, the issue of um, education, he's not being educated. These are women going into the forest looking for water, health. These are the issues. So water security, water security, sorry. Water security as a potential driver of transformation, social justice, and peace. It has many aspects as in terms of good governance, strong institutions, peace and political insta uh, stability, the issues of financing. But I want to focus on this blue um, arc there, drinking water and human well-being. How that has such a remarkable contribution to what we are talking about in terms of susceptibility of youth, the, um, their displacements, their feeling of being disenfranchised, they are not being properly educated or integrated. Okay, so what is being done globally? We all are familiar with the SDGs and SDG six is what focus on water and its aim is to leave no one behind. In Nigeria, the Nigerian government is responding to SDG 6.1 and all the other SDGs, but I'm focusing on the drinking water one. And firstly, at the highest, at the highest level, the Nigerian government has demonstrated high political will by de declaring an, um, a state of emergency in the sector. And then so these are some of the projects that have been implemented. I've put some of the budgets there. And all these projects have tremendous opportunities for youth employment 
in terms of being innovators, pump technicians, monitoring and evaluation. But when I try to get the numbers of youth that have been engaged, it's unknown, which is the main gap that I am focusing on. It's a tremendous missed opportunity. Youth and unemployment rates there, 53.4%, um, more than half of the youths are not employed or they work less than 20 hours a day, 20 hours a month. And it's a gendered issue. Women are more affected. The men are affected as well. However, the foreign development in the foreign development in investment indicators notes that productivity and in and innovation the kind of jobs and the number of people employed and skills generated is a fundamental way to to assess the impact of funds received why don't we use this even for domestic resources so this is the gap and I would like to emphasize that the Ministry of Water Resources at federal and at state level, stakeholders in the water sector, the Ministry of Labor and Thank you, uh, Dr. Bolu. Um... We will circle back to you uh, after everyone has, has had a chance to speak. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. And just uh, a reminder that we will take questions and review comments after all our panelists have made their initial presentations. Our next panelist is um, Abiola Akiode uh, Forlabi, Dr. Abiola is the Executive Director of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. She is also a prominent voice of the feminist movement in Africa, where she advocates for gender equality, voice, and participation of women and girls in all spheres. Abiola advocates for gender rebalancing in resources, legal rights, and participation, as well as equal social relations. She emphasizes she emphasizes specific needs of women to promote multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multicultural context. Abiola is currently the chairperson of the Transi Transition Monitoring Group, which is the largest civil society coalition on elections in Nigeria. She is also the acting secretary, West African Law and Religion Society. Abiola lectures at the University of Lagos and has several academic publications to her credit. Abiola will discuss the gender dimensions of banditry as well as the challenges banditry and abductions pose to life and property in Nigeria. And I will now call on Abiola to share her knowledge and perspectives with us. And I apologize for saying Dr. Abiola, um, I didn't mean to do that. So I'll call on Abiola to share her knowledge and perspectives with us. All right. Um, thank you very much, my, uh, my sister Rita. Um, and thank you for moderating this session. I wanted to use my uh, video, but I think um, yesterday I had a, a big issue with my computer. So I'm using a borrowed uh, laptop. So I'm not very familiar with how to get to that. So uh, probably we'll just, um, I'll just keep going on like that. Um, this is a very interesting conversation. And I want to thank the organizers for bringing this up and also for uh, letting it come from the uh, mouth of women. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Professor Rita, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can all, right. all hear you. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so um, it's, it's quite uh, good that we're having this discussion and women are taking the lead in this conversation. I thank Professor Kome, uh, the Legal Studies Association and other uh, 
or the organizers of this meeting. Well, I, I want to say about that a banditry and kidnapping are bad shoes, bad shoes on Nigerians' feet. And for so long, we have been working this for far too long. It is something that it's a shoe that we need to drop. Uh, it just didn't start yesterday. Uh, abductions didn't just start in 1999. It's always been there one way or the other. So it has gradually become, become like an epi epidemic. It's a national cap cap calamity. It's no longer the fear of uh, abductions in the bushes that we have all across the country, but right in the bedroom. Uh, people are afraid of recent, I think about um, a week ago, there was a news, uh, there was a story in the newspaper of a woman who decided to uh, organize an abduction to be able to collect money, you know, from her husband. So, uh, they, so, so the point is that, so it's no longer something that is far away, it's something that it is uh, quite uh, close to us. So it's been a traveling business in Nigeria with everyone, it doesn't really matter whether you are rich or you are poor. So it is, so you can be abducted whether you're rich or poor, you know, it depends on uh, the reason for the abduction. It, quite a lot of people were abducted in Borno state. They're not rich people. It's not because they're gonna get money from them, but because uh, they want to uh, negotiate some political attention. So, so abduction is not only focusing on the rich, but it's becoming a classless thing. So it's always been in the country, and if we recall the Niger Delta uh, military during that those period, you know, uh, uh, where uh, takes hostage some of the uh, people working uh, in Chevron, uh, Chevron oil, uh, um, oil uh, companies, and all of that. So, so the point I'm trying to raise is that it's not new, but it becomes a little bit uh, scary after 1999 when we saw quite a, a lot of that coming with the um, Boko Haram insurgency and all the several other cases coming up. So, but uh, abduction has been for, and bad literature has been for several reasons. One, to create fear. So we have seen quite a lot of people in Nigeria cannot move to do their normal businesses because of the fear of abduction. It has also been for political reasons. So people also do that to negotiate. They also, there are also assumptions that these are also done to negotiate power. You know, uh, there are insinuations that what we saw in 2015 was also part of negotiation of power when uh, the, uh, uh, when the Boko Haram insurgency took over the space. And we could also see a lot of political undertones, you know, around uh, the issue of what the uh, insurgents, you know, were doing in the Northeast in Nigeria. It could also be for extortion. It could be to recruit fighters. It also could be to gain uh, international popularity or attention, you know. So adoption, kidnapping has taken different uh, ways and there seems to be, and I'm going to talk about at us as also uh, uh, people playing different roles. You know, there are investors, there are people dealing in the arms, you know, and ammunition. There are also some people that are informant. You know, so it's already creating like a business-like role that people have different roles that they are playing in the process of adoption. Two seventy-six teenage girls, teenage girls were adopted from school in uh, the Northeast Nigeria, I, I happen to be part of the Bring Back Our Girls. And my sojourn with my work had taken me through uh, Chibok and some other places. So yeah, it has also pushed me to push for a safe school uh, policy in Nigeria, coming after the safe school declaration. And before then I had the opportunity of going around the six geopolitical zones to go into schools, you know, to find out the state of security, you know, in the schools. And of course, uh, even from the outer mouth of the children, we, we can understand that the school is very vulnerable, you know, to a lot of adoption. And that's why we have quite a number from uh, Zamfara case to the case of students that were adopted in Kaduna, uh, to the cases of Greenfield, you know, and quite a number. When the uh, Boko Haram insurgency abducted the, the children in uh, Chibok, people thought it was a northern issue. Uh, but by the time they came to Lagos, it became very obvious that it cannot be seen as a regional issue. It is a national calamity that needs to be addressed. So, this has been 
paid to negotiate, and I think from records that we have, about 89 billion Nigerian Niger Naira, you know, has been given as ransom, you know, for ab abduction, you know, uh, in, in the country in the last two or three years. Um, of course, because of our other peculiar conflict issue, the issue of Zamfara State uh, became very prominent, caught between uh, the issue of aiders and farmers, uh, kidnappers and banditry and quite, you know, uh, a whole lot of other things, you know, uh, uh, driving, became the driving force for uh, abduction. Makodi also had his own, uh, 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 his own uh, adoption, um, manifestation of adoption in Makodi too, in different ways. Uh, people have tried as much as possible to find a way of responding to the issue. Uh, indigenous knowledge have become very important and very critical. Uh, Vigilante uh, had taken position, and that's why we see the development in the southwestern part of Nigeria and other part of Nigeria with their Moteko uh, in the southeastern part. You know, there are also developments of um, uh, uh, vigilante form of uh, community support for their people, knowing fully that um, uh, this ad adoption of banditry has become uh, a serious uh, issue of insecurity. So, and we have also seen that there are also patterns where community come together to resist uh, abduction or kidnapping or banditry. They, 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 they regroup and come back. And so we've seen a lot of communities being burned down. We've seen repressive attack on the people. And of course, the question on the mouth of everyone is, so where is security? Where are the police? What is the role of the government? Uh, as a lawyer, I know, as a matter of fact, that the constitution is clear with respect to uh, what is expected from every government, you know, to be able to take care of its people. And of course, what we have seen in recent time is to uh, is 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 that uh, the the government has failed, you know, its people in this regard. Uh, about nine hundred and thirty-seven people were, have been kidnapped in Kaduna State alone. And uh, when we started, the moderator talked about what happened in Zamfara. In Nigeria, from uh, premium times data, about 4,962 4, people have been reported, you know, abducted between 2015 and 2021. Um, so, and this is uh, quite uh, a, a big um, issue, you know, affecting, you know, the country. So it's had come to a level where we have an average of 13 persons uh, had been abducted daily in Nigeria. And that is also a report from Vanguard, uh, which is a report that they got from the SBM intelligence, bringing it to in Nigeria in 2021 alone by first half, 2,371 2, number of persons have been kidnapped. So what are the uh, root causes and drivers of banditry and abduction in Nigeria? Um, as I said, it, uh, it, there are two primary uh, reasons. One could be for political bargaining, bargaining or economic gains. Uh, and, but beyond that explanation, there are people are abducted for different reasons. Some of the reasons I've mentioned, even for uh, illicit intercourse, marriage, prostitution, and a whole lot of other, other reasons. Um, so there are several factors that have been adduced as the driving force for banditry in Nigeria, unemployment, and I think uh, Dr. Onobolu had mentioned that you know, clearly about the fact that uh, there's a huge unemployment uh, in the country. Um, and of course, when people don't have something to do, when there are no uh, economic when the, when the economy is not viable to be able to respond to the need of the people, people then find whatever that they that can keep them to, to survive. Then uh, the, the other issue is also the issue of equity. Uh, when, when there's no justice uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system, then there is a, there is a major challenge uh, in terms of how uh, the behavior of people can be you know, regulated. Uh, the other issue is the issue of corrupt, uh, corruption uh, in Nigerian poli polity, which is a major issue. The leadership failure, so the system failure. So we have a systemic problem. So, the, so we cannot divorce the issue of banditry and abduction from the fact that we are already in a, the state is already failed in its duty to be able to respond to its people. So there's also the poor security system, uh, so which is also linked to the fact that the state is failed. There's also the issue of loss of social 
a societal value. Of course, there is also uh, the issue of hard drug influence, which is something that it's uh, a major issue, not only in public, but also in our different schools uh, across the country. Um, so having said that, there are also, uh, this also uh, affects women differently. Um, I want to also say that we're not saying that women are not abductors or women are not part of the bandits. I think it would be wrong to assume that banditry and ab abduction is just a male thing. Uh, so it, there's also a gender dimension. Uh, there's also a gender dimension uh, to this. Uh, but banditry has different consequences for women and girls, as we know, men, and also for men and boys. It's also, uh, it's often a, dra a dramatic increase in number of women at, uh, of household when they kill their husband, when they become widows, you know, it gives additional responsibility to women, you know, and a whole lot of other things. I'm looking at time now. Uh, so there are a whole lot of other things that we can uh, that we, we can see. But unfortunately, the Women, Peace and Security uh, Resolution 1325, 1860, and a whole lot of other things, a whole lot of that resolution by the UN was supposed to respond to some of these issues. So we have policies, we have laws, but unfortunately, some of those laws and policies are not women have indigenous knowledge and with this in this indigenous, indigenous knowledge are, are not often time used to address some of these issues so what are some of the challenges let me just quickly go to that um one, one of the major things is that banditry and, banditry and abduction has resulted in huge human fatalities and injuries. Uh, it has compounded social risk and cost of business and discourages investments because people don't want to come to the country for the reason that they are afraid that their life is not secured. That's led to loss of money and property. Uh, it has also led to it has created an atmosphere of mental uh, mental fa fatigue, people are afraid, you know, they don't know what to do. That's also affected the livelihood of people. So in conclusion, uh, there are three things that I think we need to do to be able to address this issue. One is that we need to have empowered citizens, citizens that can make uh, the right decisions in terms of who leads the country, people who can hold government accountable, who can ask the right question. We need to have a state that is efficient. We also need to have policy and laws that are effective and efficient to be able to address the huge problem of banditry and abduction that we have in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't Thank know you. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Abiola. Um, thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Julie Sander. Julie is the Principal Research Fellow at the Center for Strategic Research and Studies, National Defense College, Nigeria. And she is also currently the Acting Provost of the Center. Julie has more than 25 years of extensive policy research experience in peacekeeping, women's peace and security, and civil military relations. Julie is considered an expert in leadership development and course design as evidenced by her work in managing strategic level peace support operations training for ECOWAS and the African Union, as well as with gender responsiveness programming for the security sector. Julie has also served on the international board of the US-based Peace Operations Training Institute. Julie will discuss the, the gender dimensions of banditry and the polit politicization of banditry in Nigeria as well. I'll now hand the mic over to Julie. Um, thank you very much, Rita. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> Um, so looking at what we're discussing here this, this afternoon or this morning, I'd like, you know, to start by saying, you know, I think what is, what is obvious is that the contemporary global security landscape, you know, has changed from what we used to know it, um, know it to be in the, in the, um, in the Cold War era. Of course, since the post-Cold War era, things have changed very rapidly. Um, instabilities, fragilities have increased, you know, the speed at which uh, threats, you know, to security appear. Um, every time we talk about contemporary threats or emerging threats, because something new is always appearing. So it has become, you know, our world has become very unstable. 
um, I'm, I'm unstable and, um, and of course very complex because of these increasing um, instabilities and fragilities. And of course, in our part of the world, um, this is even more obvious where I'm sitting at in Nigeria, in West Africa, um, the changes are just every day you're waking up to something new. I mean, whoever dreamt that in West Africa, we will still be talking about coups, you know, um, as, as means of changing government at this time in our, in our development. But this is how, you know, things are rapidly evolving. Of course, allusions have been made to issues of, of, of bad governance, you know, and so on that of course would increase all of this instability and fragility of states and so on. So, you know, the, the, the fluidity in the nature of security threats um, are characterized by increased struggles and contestations over scarce resources, which we know very well, but increasingly also over contested identities and religious tensions. And of course, Nigeria is one political environment where all of these, you know, are, are very evident. Um, so, you know, fast forward to where we're at today. Of course, in 2014, we were only talking about Boko Haram. But where we're sitting at today, we're talking about, uh, you know, what our topic is all about, insurgency, banditry, abductions. I mean, the last speaker said we've had all of these things before, but not at the magnitude of which we're experiencing them now. And then, of course, them popping up in, in parts of the world where we didn't think it was going to happen, you know. So the speed and the magnitude, you know, of, of, of you know, this, these criminalities is, um, like she also said, it has become an epidemic, and which is why we're discussing it today. And so, you know, looking, focusing, um, of course, on, on, on Nigeria, um, and particularly looking at, at, at Northern Nigeria, which has become, you know, unfortunately the poster child, if you like, you know, for the manifestation of these uh, different insecurities. Um, we, we see that, of course, like I said, in 2014, we we're talking about Boko Haram and we we're talking about the Northeast. Um, then we began to talk about, you know, uh, the pastoralists and the farmers issues, you know, and, and related issues in the middle belt of Nigeria. And um, of course, like the last speaker also said at that time, you know, oh, this is the middle belt, oh, this is the North, you know. Um, and then of course it began to spread. And now it's not just the middle belt and the Northeast, but it's also the entire North because Zamfara state and all of the states in that axis have become, you know, the epicenter for the abductions and banditry. So of course, abductions, we used to see them on the highway, we were afraid to travel, you know. Um, yes, it's still happening, but <laughs> of course, the elites, we, we have, we have a flight now to everywhere. You know, you fly now from Abuja to Jos, you fly from Abuja to Bauchi, you know, you even fly to Kaduna. But so, you know, um, so what becomes the soft target then is the schools. The schools have become the soft target. And um, so in the increase, you know, we see with abductions in schools and so on, there have been insinuations and actually some evidence from some research that you're beginning to see you know, a convergence of interest between Boko Haram, Iswap, and the so-called bandits, you know, and, 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 and um, you know, armed bandits and so on. Now, I don't even want to, to start on the politics of, of, of naming, because that's, that's, that's a big, big issue we've had to deal with in this whole issue. If I do have time, of course, I'll go into the politics of naming, you know, um, is, is a rose by any other name just a sweet, you know? Uh, so, so, but anyway, we're calling them bandits and, you know, we've been afraid to put the tag or, of something more serious, you know, on it. But, you know, so let's just keep that there for a while. So, but, you know, saying all of this is, is to say that it's okay to talk about, you know, the, the, the politics and the high sounding um, um, theories and so on that, that relate to these issues, but then, if we want to look at the, the impact you know, on, on people, if we're looking at human security, then we must be looking at the impact on people. And so this is why I'm bringing it to is the issue of human security. And if we're looking at human security, then we must put on a gendered lens because most of the discourse and the discussion that we have 
in the media, even in academia, in policy circles, is both gender blind and gender neutral. And you know, so people make sweeping statements. And um, at the end of the day, then where does that leave you? Are you still are you seeing the actual human beings that are, are affected? Um, it's the same thing with the economy. You know, when you say Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa, you're talking about GDP and so on. Now I'm, I'm not an economist, so you know, uh, pardon me if I make mistakes on that issue. But you know, so you talk about GDP and all of that. Well, when you come to per capita, you look at the individuals, you know, what is their own, what is their, their condition of livelihood? You know, how does that, you know, wonderful uh, biggest economy in Africa, how does it translate in my home? You know, how does it affect, you know, my own, you know, uh, family budget? You know, how does it affect my standard of living? So I'm, I'm, again, I'm just saying that to emphasize the point I'm making about human security, that if we have to look at this in terms of human security, we must put on a gendered lens so that we see everyone that is behind every abduction that happens, you know? So, you know, yes, um, so we must put on a gendered lens, basically is the point um, I want to make there so that we see, you know, who exactly is, is affected, who exactly is doing what, to whom, what are the, impact, what's the impact, what are the effects, you know, because it is when you have such um, a disaggregated look, you know, that your solutions or your responses then will be able to actually um, reach the people um, that you need to be talking about. Um, so, you know, and of course, in all of that, um, in looking at the gendered lens, then we, we it, it also enables us to move away from just, you know, uh, the, 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 the elite discussion and to also go down, you know, to the communities, to the grassroots. And this is what has happened with the so-called banditry that we're seeing. A lot of it is rural banditry. It's happening in our communities. It's happening in our villages. It's happening in places that are outside of the public view. And so it is easier for us to sit down and gloss over the matter, you know, and just say, Oh, people are being affected, I mean, abducted, uh, villages are being ravaged, communities are being ravaged, you know, but these communities are, are people, they're human beings in those communities. They are women, they are men, they are boys, they are girls. What abductions, school abductions have done is to bring to the fore the issue of school children, the boys and the girls. At least in those ones, when they are abducted, we hear the reportage, they tell us, oh, they're school girls or they're school boys. You know, we hear numbers about them. And, you know, so, so to that extent, we kind of know that it affects boys and girls. And I think that's also important because what happened, you know, in, in, in the immediate after, aftermath of, of, of Chibok was we kept talking about school girls, school girls, and yes, school girls. But what has happened now with, uh, with, with what has been happening in the Northwest since, since 2020, is that it's become, I don't know, an equal opportunity assailant. So it's boys, it's girls, you know, young people, all of them have become victims of abductions. And what's the implication of that? This is a part of Nigeria that, you know, over the years is the most disadvantaged in terms of education, generally. The highest number of out of school children are from Northern Nigeria. And even in Northern Nigeria, you know, some of those states have the worst figures of out of school children. Um, I remember in 20, I don't know, some, I think 20, 20, 2006, 2007, the campaign at that time, we were being told that there were 10 million out of school children. We're still banding a figure of about 10 million, 10.5. But I don't think we have the most current figures, you know. So that has worsened, that has worsened, that number is worse now because you have, you know, the, the traditional 10.5 million. But then you have now children who are in school who are being forced out of school because the Safe School Initiative is not in the Northwest. Even what claims to be in the Northeast has, has failed. What you have with government as a measure, you know, to deal with, with abductions from school, mass, you know, abductions of school children is to shut down schools. So it is the children who are in school that are again joining the already out of school children. So they're shutting down schools um, across the states. This is the solution. In fact, in one of the states, the governor said, you know, we're gonna shut down the schools until the security situation improves. So there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no end date. 
because it is not improving. The security situation is not improving. So these children are at home, boys and girls. What are they doing at home? Um, I mean, during, during the, 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 the lockdowns with the pandemic last year and so on, even children in elite schools that you know, were at home, we saw the problems we had with virtual learning. Virtually, I mean, <laughs> more than half of them were not learning because the infrastructure for the virtual learning is not there. So now we're talking about rural communities, rural children. Of course, in Kaduna State, it's not just rural, it's also in Kaduna. But um, so I, I, I'm painting, in, in talking about the gendered issue, I am I'm focusing a, a bit on children and education. Because this, for me, it's, it's, it's been a passion, okay? Because I, I, I worry, I worry that ordinarily every day, we know the situation with our schools. It's, it's not, a, it's, not, it's, not it's, it's far from ideal. Even in the elite schools, it's far from ideal. And then you have a situation where in rural schools, you're having this kind of added burden. So the, the disconnect, you know, um, between our children in rural areas and, and you know, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the urban areas is one issue. And then of course, even in terms of, um, so I, I see the yellow card. So, <laughs> So for me, it's important, like I said, when we're talking about these issues to disaggregate the data. Who is being abducted? Who is doing the abduction? Yes, we may have women amongst the bandits, but I, 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 I wager that those women are women who have been conscripted to form you know, the, the families of the abductees to service their camps. But the actual people who have the ideas, who are getting the money, who are pushing the politics behind this, I doubt that there are women amongst them. Yet, as the president himself said, the president of Nigeria, you know, last week when the African uh, First Lady's Peace Mission had a summit in Abuja, he said the worst hit by these abductions are women and children. That's an admission by the president himself. Of course, that speech was short on detail, but these are the details that we must, we must force onto the table. And we need to do more research to get that de those details on the table because it's going to have an impact on what kind of solutions we come up with. So government is not giving us data, re, uh, disaggregated data. Researchers are not giving us a disaggregated data. Um, journalists are not giving us disaggregated data. It's something that we really need to look into so that we can nuance. And which is why I really love the first presentation because it brought out aspects that nobody else would. So I commend the organizers for, for bringing women's voices because they're bringing issues that nobody else will bring on the table. I thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Julie. That was all, all, everyone has been so insightful so far. Thank you for that. Um, our next panelist is um, Mary Ikoku. Mary is the founder and president of the Emerge Women Development Initiative, a gender-focused civic organization working across Africa with a current focus on Nigeria to attain gender justice and gender equality in education, health, economic empowerment, social inclusion and leadership. Now, Mary has over 15 years of experience in organizing communities, building partnerships, peace building, providing direct services and advocating for the most effective ways to solve community issues for girls and women. Mary is a respected voice on gender equality and empowerment, education, social justice, and leadership matters. A passionate advocate for increasing the number of women in elected office, she is motivated by a lifelong commitment to progressive politics and change. Her mission is to help Nigerian women access their individual influence while using it to define their personal and professional attainment on their own terms. I will now call on Mary to share her perspectives on banditry and abductions with us. Thank you, um, Bolu. And um, I'm so um, excited really about the very first presentation. It really, really was an eye-opening one. And, and, and I'm also very glad with the previous speakers. They've said quite a lot. I'm just going to add that, I mean, part of the things that 
we looked at is that what exactly is this banditry? I've listened in and trying to figure out what, what would be the best definition of banditry. And this definition of banditry, is it really what we experience in Nigeria or do we create an entirely whole new different definition for banditry when it comes to Nigeria? And um, in a layman's language, it's really an organized action done by rebels or outlaws that pose, poses a threat to security. And banditry always comes with violence. But in Nigeria, it usually involves armed robbery and kidnapping and abduction. And even something you would seem to, that appears as if it's terrorism. So I, I think that one of the things that we may need to begin to have conversations around is that Nigerians need to understand what a banditry really is and what we are experiencing and what the differences are. Because sometimes everything that has been lumped under banditry are not are just too major, too severe, too serious to be called bandit. And then some people also politicize some of these things, but that's not really why we're here. And um, for me, I think considering the fact that bandits invade community, destroying houses, properties, and crops, and this is what we've got seen with the current Heather's farmers clashes all over the country. And the Heather's farmers clashes is something we felt was more, more uh, prominent in, the, in, in some part of the country. But now it has gone to Enugu, it has gone to Oyo, it has gone, we know an elder statesman, uh, a former presidential candidate who was relayed in his farm. That is one. And they are all being summed up under banditry. So considering this fact, it seems like the end point is to scare inhabitants away. This is the end point of banditry. Scare the inhabitants away from their homes so they can settle. And that's some of the things we hear around Kaduna uh, South. This is what happens around Kaduna area, the kind of banditry that happens there. And then and the banditry is in different forms across the country. It shows up in different ways, right? So what do we now, in context, in Nigerian context, banditry could mean so many different things, but can we really, as, as in this forum, really make it clear to understand what constitutes banditry and what constitutes terrorism? And these are, a banditry comes with abductions, it comes with killings, it comes with maiming of lives and all of that. It's no longer about this kind of petty people scaring people away so they can pick your things, run away with them, take your crops or make money. We've seen government actually negotiating with bandits. We've seen bandits that actually will, that are actually wielding weapons that are more powerful than our military. We are in a situation where bandits are killing military. Is this still the same meaning of what we, we've seen, a dictionary meaning of a banditry? That's one. And then we, we go down to how did we even get here? How did we get here? How did we come about banditry in our nation? And it's so clear that the issue of banditry has been occurring. It's just that sometimes I think Nigerians, we tend to we, we, we have selective amnesia. Sometimes we tend to forget so easily. It hasn't been long that we experienced this across the, in the country. We remember 2010 when we were going to do Nigeria assisting, how they struck. That is one. So the issue has been occurring way before now. It can be traced back to the pre-civil war when government broke down in the Western part of Nigeria, leading to a lot of political violence and organized crime. I remember, I mean, my people running with the Oso Abiola and all of that. People who hide under, under political crisis to permit, permit their own banditry. Even in our electoral system, you see a lot of banditry being exhibited by politicians, by political actors, right? So this 2015, if I may, 
just as Boko Haram is presently dealing with the Northwest, part of Nigeria is uh, Northwestern part of Nigeria is known to suffer from banditry with the major driver being the presence of conflicting interests. And we need to look at it is interest between two parties. So both the Fulanese and the Hausas fight for limited resources. And we need to begin to call these things what they are. And what are they really fighting for? They will do anything to ensure they have access to that limited resource. Even if it means killing, maiming, or abduct, abduct, abducting, you know? And also in order to, um, sometimes you see that in, in order to sponsor their activities or in order for them to survive, you see them making use of abduction to do, as, as a bait for ransom. And then we've come to a point where we're having government functionaries, our government, actually negotiating with bare-faced terrorists all under the heading of banditry. And that takes us to what can we say is the root cause and what has been driving banditry and abductions in Nigeria. For me, one thing that comes to mind for me is that one major cause of banditry will be the failure of government. Sometimes people want to say it's poverty. Well, there's so many poor people here, but they are not committing this crime. But when there is no deterrence, I think that one major problem we have that fuels banditry will be the failure of this government or even successive government, post past government, to provide enabling conditions for everyone, every citizen of Nigeria to cohabitate and provide security for everybody. And, you know, there's also the, the, the divisiveness and very poor communication from government actors that have further deepened the crime, the hate, the, 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 the unsafe condition of people in Nigeria. And the second one I could think of is the rising unemployment. It will, the rising unemployment rate is naturally going to uh, 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 uptick the poverty rate and push factors that make people turn to crimes in order to make a living. Nigerians need to understand that the reason uh, the, the, the Western world make it a point of note to put, pay for unemployment when somebody who has been on a job uh, loses his or her job, they place you on, on unemployment and you get paid because they understand that an idle, man is, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. And this is one factor that Nigerian government have not come to terms with. That as far as you continue to uh, 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 put more families to, to, to get in, in under the poverty line, the crime rates will increase, right? And, and you make people to turn to these crimes in order to make a living. If not, what, what are all these negotiations about? You even have uh, uh, siblings adopting themselves. Banditry abduction is a thriving business in Nigeria today. Friends can, out of school, can arrange their own abduction and take turns to call each parents to come and provide the ransom money. And that is how bad things have gone. And then, uh, and, and then they, they re I said, like the reluctance of the government is also, uh, 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 the, the reluctance of the government to actually name these bandits name them terrorists is another reason why the atrocity is thriving in the northern part of Nigeria. Because look at what has happened. A young man in the southeast has been clamoring for uh, uh, um, to go their own way. But the federal government was so in tune and very quick and proactively have labeled them, uh, proscribed them terrorist group. You see? But that is not happening. You see, it's a different ball game when it comes to the North. And that's why, because the government is reluctant to name the bandit terrorists, in, and this is a reason uh, 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 this atrocity is still prevalent and it's striving in the North. Another, uh, the other thing is that crime 
thrives in contests where there is little deterrence. And that's why that deterrence must be important. Appropriate sanctions and punishment to this bandit would go a long way uh, you know, in, in solving or deterring people and not raising more people to do, who will see it. Oh, this is a lucrative business. I'm going to join it. It wouldn't. It shouldn't be so. So in most, in most of, um, I think if you look at the most of Nigeria's rural communities, there are many opportunities for criminal activity. But for one thing, some of these communities are located in remote areas where there is little or no government presence. So you can now begin to understand why banditry thrives in some places and doesn't in another place. So geography plays a role. And then we need to look at the role of geography too. Like in the Northwestern Nigeria, there, there are for, forest lands are vast, unlike the, the South that is so built up and getting more cosmopolitan. So that, 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 that their households are in some cases separated by an interface, interspace with forest uh, areas. You know, this also renders them vulnerable to banditry. Then we need to look at that, that the situation is made worse for our brothers and sisters in the Northern region by the absence of, in fact, all over the country, the absence of effective community policy mechanisms, which is capable of addressing the hinterland's peculiar security challenges. This we must note that while I think that geography do play a huge role, community policing is also a thing because where, you, where the Northwestern Nigeria's forest lands are vast, they are rugged and hazardous. They are also grossly under police, you see? So some of the forests run alongside, you remember the Sambisa forest that became like a desert that no human being can enter. It's a problem. They, 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 are, they are grossly under police. Some of the forests run alongside the diverse porous borderlines of the region's frontiers. So you can understand what is also happening in, uh, around the side where you have Chad, Bene, and all of those kind of crimes from there. Our porous border, borders need to be looked into. These are some of the things I think that approaches that government need to look at and take them seriously because they are continuing to, you know, fuel banditry in our hinterland. And, and, and borders, um, sometimes, in fact, not sometimes, they are mostly delineated. They are mostly delineated under police and not well governed. In fact, governance in Nigeria literally most times stops at the state level. The, the local communities and the rural communities they are they're really uh, in, in God's hand, you know, for their own leadership. They are, they are, and then the consequences of this is an abundance of nefarious activities by these hoodlums and often facilitated by criminal syndicates. And then you now have those who are educated, who can see business opportunity in banditry, now taking it to a whole new level and making negotiations for them, they know how to use the tools of um, uh, uh, technology. They bring in tech into it because they've seen a business opportunity here. Because the government have refused to do their play their part. So in effect, whether you go up, go north, go south, go see east, one fundamental, one key thing that we must take home is that when a nation is under siege is going through crisis, is going through war, real or cold or seen. The group of people who get affected the most are women, women and children. And then that part of gender can never be overemphasized because you know that they are not just, uh, like uh, uh, my sister Abiola said earlier, that they are not absorbed from banditry themselves. But I can tell you that in, 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 in reality, women are not attuned to committing crime in percentage in, with the way you, when men do. 
and you can, I mean, I, I, I would think that women have more restraint in part the society. Um, thank you, uh, Mary. We, we've run out of time for the first go round. I apologize for uh, having to meet you. Uh, so thank you, uh, distinguished members of our panel for your very insightful and much salient points. Um, we started out with uh, Dr. Uh, Bolu talk, making it a resource issue, a resource issue. Uh, we talked about failure of government, uh, hesitance, hesitancy to label um, banditry, uh, what it should be labeled and all other things. Um, I will, we will move right along to taking questions uh, from the audience because Dr. Funke has been summarizing and highlighting things for us uh, in the chat. So no need to do that. Uh, so what questions do we have for our panel members? So we, we, um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Okay. Um, from John Odu, we, we have, with all the bodies of water we have in Nigeria, why is it difficult for the government to guarantee its citizens access to potable water? Okay. And then we also have another question from- well, let's, let's take the first one. Let's you want to one. take them one by one? Okay. Yes, let's, let's do that. So, uh, who on the panel wants to uh, talk about why you know, Nigeria is covered? <laughs> We're covered with water, but uh, we can't guarantee access to it. Okay, um, I'd like to take that. And that's a very valid question. Um, however, we also need to understand that the time when water was just a question of going to the stream, and um, utilizing it is long gone because of the issues of pollution um, from various sources. So it costs money, it needs strong institutions to treat the water, distribute it. It also needs the cooperation of communities in terms of how they access the willingness to pay for the water. So the government is um, trying its best, but you will agree with me that water is one of those resources that is handled by everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the political constituency projects of senators, where oftentimes they are given an allocation for water and the water in many times, rather than going to the most vulnerable, goes to their constituents over and over again, leaving behind some of those people that I showed in this picture. So what's the way forward? Firstly, we need to um, ensure that we follow the guidance of the lead institutions in terms of standards, in terms of designs. And then the Nigerian um, way of not rehabilitating things, having white elephant projects is also quite common in um, the water sector. We don't operate, we don't maintain. And then the issue of gender as well, I, um, Convey the network of female professionals in water and sanitation, it's important that the voices, that the skills of women in the sector is also heard. And um, if these things are put together, we will be able to use the resources more efficiently, target the people that really need this water and um, progress towards the SDG 6.1 goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would any other member of the panel like to chime in on this? Sure. Can I just say one word? Sure. 
Thanks. Um, I think as, as, as citizens, we need to also, you know, become more involved in governing this quote unquote ungoverning, ungoverned spaces in our land because there are so many. Ungoverned because government is not doing what it's supposed to do. But so for how long are we gonna sit down and watch? You know, um, and in any case, this is democracy and it should be participatory. It should be inclusive. Uh, we, we, those of us who do have the voice should begin to use it, you know, and um, then carry others along. And so in some of these governance issues, because I see things that are happening um, around us in Abuja here, like, you know, we have so many estates all over the place. Um, so the failure in the management of those things um, has, has caused, you know, now homeowners to actually begin to take on the management of their estates themselves. So this is what I'm saying that, you know, we need to be involved more in some of these governance issues, like in, in, in Abuja now. So they're taking on the, the management of their estates. They're determining who is going to manage the estate, you know, how we're going to share water, you know, different infrastructure like that. So we need to be involved um, and not sit down and wait. Of course, we've been told by the experts that, you know, government is doing the best it can, you know, that's the best is not good enough for us, you know, so, but for how long are we gonna keep waiting for them? Is that we need to get involved in engaging them. There's, there's to set the standards. We should insist that the standards are set and that, you know, people know what the standards are. And then we should help also in implementing these standards in our own spaces um, where we live. And of course, then begin to amplify the voices and take them to where the other people are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julie, for that also. Um, we'll move on to, to the next question that we have. Um, this um, is asking, how do we cope with the problems caused by the state of insecurity in the country? How do we get the government to rise up to its duty of securing the lives of citizens? How do we solve these problems of insecurity? Any member of the panel can tackle this one. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take that. And I think it's related to the next question that was directly asked of me about what do we do in circumstances where there are systemic suppression of Corbyn abduction and insurgency. Okay. I, I think there has been uh, several ways that um, people had uh, proposed. Uh, part of it has also been um, the need for us to, to look at our legal framework you know, to redefine, you know, our parameters as a country. Um, so, of course, there are a, a whole lot of um, problems of um, tribalism, ethnicity, and and what have you that have been defining, you know, some of the things that we see that manifest as insecurity in the country. Uh, people are calling for national dialogue. People are calling for sovereign national conference where people can also determine because whether we like it or not, some of these discussions still have a lot of undertones of where we're coming from. So maybe there is a need for us to also redefine appropriately who we are. Nobody's saying that the country should be divided because the, the truth of the matter is that uh, majority of the people, we are just, we are all victims. That's the truth of the matter, you know, of some very few people who are controlling the country. So I, I, there, there, there should be more uh, dialogue. Uh, there should also be more community accountability process. You know, we, yes, the government has a duty to rise up to securing the lives of the citizens, but we need to make demand. I think we, we are not making demand enough. Uh, when uh, bandits come into uh, communities, destroy the place uh, and leave, people say maybe it's, it's an act of God. You know, uh, people are not, so, they are not raising the issue of, uh, of the insecurity and the fact that there are supposed to be provisions made by the government as a result of tax and all of that. Um, I can see you laughing. Maybe I should just raise the top point. Um, the other issue that I want to also raise is also that it's important for us to address the question of impunity. I think about a few days ago, uh, the issue of Evans, uh, Evans, who uh, the, the, the kidnapper, uh, has been in court for almost five, six years. So at times, justice delayed is justice denied. We see a lot of time when they come to say they have identified the abductors and the kidnappers, and people don't get to hear anything, you know, again. So, there's a need for us to begin a culture of deterrence, you know, to be able to address some of these issues. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, would another member of the panel like to uh, chime in on that before we move on to the next question? Okay, I see Mary, are you? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think what I'm, the, the, the answer to that question, uh, I mean, Dr. Bella has, you know, explained it, but I also want to, you know, point the, the person who asked that question to Dr. Abiola's earlier submission about having to elect quality people with integrity, people with competence, people with capacity. Because when you have leaders who have capacity, who are who, who have who are courageous leaders, who are visionary, you won't even be dealing with these issues and nothing is done about it. What we are struggling with this issue is because you actually have across, in fact, in my own state is, my state, Abia State is the SI unit of the failed state called Nigeria, because my state has everything that is wrong with the system. Uh, uh, so we need to elect people who have competence, character, people who have integrity, people who, who can really deliver the common goods. And when the common goods are delivered, people are in employment, people are not out of job. And the few who are not, who are out of job, will be taken care of by the system through different safety net programs. And this safety net program can only, can, can only be thought about by a, a developed mind. So it is just what it is. Let's get it right with fixing the po monopolistic political space that we have. It will go a long way in solving these problems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that. Um, I think the next question has been answered in answering the, this current question. So uh, I'll ask the one after it, which is, uh, uh, Oluchuk was observing and commenting that there is no mention of intelligence in uh, the presentations by the panelists. And is saying that there is the need for introduction of intelligence studies in our school curriculum and says that intelligence needs to be taught in our schools to teach students it is what it is and how they can make use of it in their respective communities. That sort of segues into the next question by Esther, which says, how do academic researches get to be implemented for solutions by those at the helm of government affairs in Nigeria? And that question is directed at Ju Julie, um, so Julie, if you can sort of answer those two questions, how do we in introduce intelligence studies into our curriculum and how do academic researches actually uh, become practicalized and actualized um, in, as part of our educational system so that um, we make a difference? Okay, sure. On the issue of intelligence studies, I don't think it's a problem of, of teaching intelligence studies in school. Um, there's so many things we're packing into the curriculum these days that at the end of the day, nothing even makes sense anymore. Because everything, I see everything, oh, we want a curriculum, we want a curriculum on this, on that. And these were things that were dealt with in, in civic studies, for example. You know, you just, I, I, I think, you know, we just need to, 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 to teach children you know, um, proper civics, you know, your responsibilities, you know, you know what you expect, you know, of the state, you also know what you should, what a citizen is, what your responsibilities are, you know, in addition to whatever your, your rights and privileges are. I think those are the kind of things that will help us ultimately, you know, um, as opposed to teaching um, intelligence studies and some of the other things, you know, that we're teaching and replacing um, some other useful uh, courses with. You know, so you have you have streams. I hear these days in school where they're teaching commercial studies, and um, you know you're you're taking subjects like typing in WAEC. I mean, I I just hear them; it's ridiculous. So um, you know, we need some some general, you know, um, what you'd call maybe liberal arts kinds of 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 of, of, of foundation. You know, so that we're well-rounded, you know, children and citizens, and then specializations can come later in life. That's, that's what I believe. Um, on the issue of, of intelligence, I, I, I understand, you know, some of where that question is coming from. It's because, you know, our, our policing structures, our community structures are broken and that kind of thing. 
um, we, we always hear it, you know, told, you know, about the good old days, you know, of how, you know, a new person comes into a community, you know, you know who it is and you have a way of, you know, um, letting the, whoever the, the leaders in the community are know that kind of thing. Now we live in this, you know, anonymized, atomized societies, everybody's minding their business. And um, at the end of the day, you know, when things collapse, all of us are affected. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, how you don't even know who your neighbor is these, these, these days. So it's just those kind of, of community life that we need to be talking about and, and, and reviving, whether in urban areas or in rural areas, because even in rural areas, some of these things, you know, are, are getting lost. But I think these are the things, some of the values that we need to get back. And um, of course, then if you, if you, you should know that if you see something like we hear on TV here, if you see something, say something. But you know, the question I ask is, who are you saying this something to? Who are you telling? Do you know where the nearest police station is? How citizen friendly is the, is the police station? You know, can I go into the police station and say, um, this is happening? And, and I, I, had, I had an incident three days ago, actually, where I witnessed an accident, um, a, a, you know, a road, a road you know, accident. And there was, we have these, uh, what do you call them? Emergency numbers. And I called the numbers, I called several times, nobody was, 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 was responding. But you know, the thing here as usual is cars were stopping, you know, almost causing other crashes because they were stopping to see what was happening. This car was rolling off, you know, the road. And I remembered, I said, oh, now we have emergency numbers. So I called several times, it didn't work. So I then called, you know, um, the FCT call lines. And after about three uh, tries, somebody picks the phone, you know, and I say, I try to explain to her, what I just saw and I'm like please could you get to the relevant agency and you know generally she was talking as if I was you know just getting on her nerves you know but at the end of the day eventually you know someone responded and something was done so I'm, I'm saying that to say about if we're saying people uh, telling people see something say something we should we should have you know clear processes and structures where those reports can be made and there will be responses at community level. You know, whatever the level of the community is, we should know what it is. So, um, so I think the call, call lines, when they do work, I think it's, it's very good. So that's what we can, kind of need to teach even children, know what the numbers are, know, you know, and everybody, you know, everybody has a mobile phone now, make a call. And of course there should be free lines. I think that's what will help us ultimately. Then on the issue of research, how do we make it work? You know, I work in something that is also a think tank. And um, I know most of the frustration we encounter with people when we say we're doing research is, oh, you know, you're always doing this research. You're always holding co conferences, seminars, workshops, because in Nigeria, you have to mention all of them together, conferences, seminars, workshops. Okay, it's one word. So, um, so they're like, you're always doing this, you know, but um, so who is implementing and so on. So people are tired and they're frustrated because they can't see a clear connect between, you know, um, the research, you know, the, 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 the knowledge and policy. It's an uphill task, but we just keep up to, have to keep doing what we have to do. Um, as a think tank, the best you can do is to make sure the advice is there, that, you know, uh, good options are placed on the table. And then ultimately it is the responsibility of the decision maker, the policy maker, to pick, but your duty is to make sure that you present those credible options, which are based on research, which is based on good research, you know, which is based on good science, make it available, and then the responsibility is theirs. I think that's the best I can say on that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Julie, for that. Um, the next question has been, Dr. Obi is going to answer the next question. I I'd like to add. I'd like to add to this um, question, if it's okay. okay. This particular uh, question. Okay, the issue of um, intelligence and the issue of um, research. Um, we work in rural and urban communities, and where banditry is common, but the community members actually reach out to our project teams to let them know when it is safe to come. So that kind of intelligence in a way is still working. 
It's not the formal structures. They're not reporting to police, but they're reporting to those who know who they know are coming to make a difference in their lives. And so they are helping to protect um, some of those people. Then in terms of research, um, I, like um, the previous speaker has said, and the person who asked the question, there is definitely a gap between academia, science, policy, and practice. Oftentimes, the academics, they are not able to translate what they are saying succinctly for the policymakers, the politicians who are so busy, you know, and in that way, the research ends up on the shelf. It's like academics speak to academics. They really need to learn how to speak to politicians. I'll relate it to the water sector, for example. Right now, we are carrying out operational research about something that I mentioned just now, where Patrick with Bank of Industry, I said a, prob a major problem in the water sector, why we are not meeting the targets is the fact that what is produced is not operated properly, it's not maintained properly. That's a simple statement. But right now we're carrying out scientifically rigorous research to show that. But beyond that, we are going to work on a number of the dysfunctional water supply system so that the we are leaving something behind. We are getting the data that we want, and then we are going to where we need to be able to translate that to the politicians. Water is about votes. Water brings votes. Water creates employment. These are the priorities of any government, whether um, it is from a good heart or just because they want to be in politics. We need to be able to translate that with scientifically rigorous research. Thank That's you. my input. Thank you, Dr. Bolu, for that. It's really, uh, it's, it's critical that we, as researchers, make connections uh, for politicians so that they can see really how things will work. Um, okay. Um, the next I want to say something. Yeah. The next question uh, goes is, um, is thanking the organizers and panelists for these webinars and then is asking, um, uh, what is it? Is asking if similar webinars can be organized to address the issue of unarmed banditry and insurgency in our halls of power by men in Akbada and some women in Gele. And Dr. Obi is going to answer this question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my distinguished moderator. I would uh, just reflect on the question. And I think that at the heart of the matter, and I want to thank uh, Bolu Waji for her comment. And I was actually intrigued by her explanation that you explained to politicians that foods are really very important for they are what I call political uh, investments. But I will just say this, that for we need to interrogate this further by saying that what does power mean for the Nigerian politician? Um, do, uh, is power an end in itself or is it a means to an end? And what is this end? I think that one of my modest suggestions is that we need to look at the concept, not just interrogate banditry as a concept or even insurgency, but how do people view power in Nigeria? Is it as a tool of oppression? Is it as a tool of expropriation? Is it as a tool of self-aggrandizement? Or is it a tool for self-service? Or is it a tool for community and people's service? Because it seems as if we need to put uh, the horse in front of the cart that 
what is the nature of power and what purpose does it serve? Does it serve for the public or does it serve the individual or a small group of people? And when you then help such people think through these things, you need to also talk about the mindset of those in power. I'll, I'll stop there. But to the interesting question that was raised, on, on armed banditry. I, I found that concept kind of an oxymoron, but it's very interesting because if we break it down to the fundamentals, it's about the relationship between state and society, the social contract, if you please. And it's about how leaders relate to their people. Are the people subjects or are they citizens? And uh, that for me is the issue that whether they are armed on an, on armed bandits and it's about them being in power how do they see themselves in relation to the rest of society and yes the organizers have been thinking about this in fact during one of our discussions we raised the issue of state society relations and it's something that i really thank uh, Dr. Komer for bringing this to us, for reminding us again, and it's going to be one in the series that we are going to begin to interrogate state society relations. And when we do that, then we would also interrogate the concept of leadership and service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Obi. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just keep uh, moving on to questions. The next one is asking, how can women lead new social movements online and offline solve these problems since our state actors have perennially become irresponsible? How do we harness the power of women online and offline? Anyway, um, I think I will take that. Okay. Yeah, um, well, I, I think that of recent we have also seen uh, to what extent women can uh, resist uh, bad governance in Nigeria. Uh, the Bring Back Our Girls uh, is one of the very strong uh, movement in Nigeria against insecurity. Uh, the feminist core uh, actually led the answers, you know, protests. They, 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 they were actually the brain behind it. So meaning that women are organizing. Uh, of recent also we had the Women Manifesto Conference. And I think that also link up to the question of academic research and also the reality of the day. And one of the things what with the Women Manifesto Conference did was to use the second day to discuss insecurity. And um, I think I could see some of the panelists here uh, who were from diaspora who joined that conversation. Now, and so what that did was also to start gradually bringing uh, gown to town you know, so that instead of us as academia just writing, you know, on one side and civil society also on the other side, you know, doing their own, declaring secure our lives, you know, moving from community to community, we find a way of bringing us all together, including the policymakers. Uh, at that conference, we also had women who were leading in some of the states who were like House of Assembly members and, and they were being asked questions, what do you do? What are you doing? And I like, one of them have been abducted and also shared our experience. So my point is that I think we need to uh, create more of that. You know, we need to have more uh, uh, organizing, you know, by women uh, who, who are also uh, grassroots women, rural women who are involved. Who, are, who have the knowledge that we are talking about, the indigenous knowledge, you can also contribute to uh, addressing some of the problems. And these are the people who can actually uh, hold government accountable and hold state actors accountable for their irresponsible behavior. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Abiola, for that. Um, someone has a raised hand. So, Dr. Bull, is that you? So, or someone in the audience? Um, there was somebody in the audience, um, I think it's Olua Shola Oni, had a raised hand for a question. So, um, oh. okay. hold on. Well, um, for some reason, he's not coming up anymore. Okay, maybe he lowered his hand. Dr. Bolu's hand is raised, so um, okay. I'll call on her. <laughs> You're muted. Thank you, moderator. I just wanted to add to what um, Dr. Abiola has succinctly um, 
described by also mentioning two groups um, well, that I convey. One is the Mothers United and Mobilized. And the principle behind that is that women are stronger when united. Um, one of the problems mentioned by one of the panelists was this issue of divisiveness that we have in our country. You know, everybody, many people just talk about or they rise up when it affects them. So this Mothers United and Mobilized, we are um, women from different religious backgrounds. It's from different political backgrounds. We're here in Nigeria and in diaspora. And our focus is youth. We lobby and we speak up and use, move things a little bit forward. And I'd already also talked about um, coming from the professional angle, women can come together, you know, um, as professionals working together to lift each other up and to influence the issues of resource um, equity in the country, which is what the network of water supply um, female professionals in Nigeria is doing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bolu, for that. Uh, Dr. Funke, your hand is raised. You know, Dr. Um, Ene Eja said that uh, Indy was not able to connect, oh. but uh, Indy gave her some remarks. Okay. She's in the rural area, you know, which we've been talking oh. about. Yeah. So can um, Dr. Ene be allowed to tell us what Indy wanted to say? Briefly. Um, well, where is she? I don't... She's in the audience. Okay. Uh, so, um, need, uh, our Zoom Dr. Expert. Okoye, can you can you enable Dr. Ene to talk? Yes, and then um, while you're doing that, uh, Julie had her hand up. I think she wanted to add something to harnessing the power of women. So, Julie, can you uh, briefly? Uh, oh, okay. Just talk real about. quick, you know, talking yes. about. A professional women coming together. Yeah. Um, we have a group um, that's a women, peace and security, you know, um, security sector reference group. And it's made up of women in the security sector, all of them, you know, whether it's military, it's the paramilitary, whatever. Um, the beauty also is that it also involves, you know, um, civil society women who are engaged in that sector. And so, you know, um, and of course, with the, with the connections in the military, in the institutions, and of course, uh, other government relevant uh, agencies that deal with issues of women, peace and security. Um, we actually just finished a two day conference. And what it is, is to try and look at security issues from you know, women's perspective in terms of how it affects women and also how the women practitioners can act actually you know, bring solutions to bear in terms of driving gender responsive um, operations. So that kind of um, initiative is, is going on. It's actually co-chaired you know, the Minister of uh, Women Affairs and the Gender Advisor in uh, Defense Headquarters, who is a one-star uh, female general. So, you know, these are some of the things we're also doing from our end. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to locate Dr. Ene. Oh, maybe she left. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, well. I, I tried searching for her, she's not, she's not there. Which is unfortunate. Yeah, it's unfortunate, um, it's unfortunate but we'll, uh, we just have a, a few more minutes before we run out of time. Um, and we have a question about media. Uh, organizers, I can keep going, right? We have, yeah. Okay, good. We have a question about media that I'll ask. And it goes, uh, don't you think the media has a major role to play in ensuring that the menace of insecurities such as banditry and kidnapping are curbed? to the barest minimum by saying it how it is rather than listening to the government and politicians who are bankrolling some of these media houses or threatening them. Um, so this is talking about journalism and how to keep it real. Who 
who on the panel would like to take this on? Well, the media is quite important anyway, because um, they, they push out the information and um, they, they feed the people on what to do, opinions and, and what have you. Um, they, 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 so they have a very important role to play in this, uh, in this regard, uh, because the uh, um, uh, maybe uh, maybe Mary would be a better person because she's a media practitioner. So I yield the floor for Mary. Yeah. Um, Mary, you've been volunteered to answer this one. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, so um, the role of media, just like I pointed out about the role of intelligence, the role of the media is, of course, uh, critical to even this subject matter. But you see, one thing we need to understand here is that who are the owners of the media? So the media owners are in one party or another. The media should have been the fourth realm of the estate and the last hope of the common man. But unfortunately, just like everything that has happened in this system, it also has affected the media. Of course, they have a big role to play too in terms of really informing the citizenry about the truth about what is going on in the country and be able to push the narrative in a way that doesn't also communicate more effectively in a way that people are not labeled in a way that it speaks with them as becoming their identity. Those are some of the things that media is forced to, to do. But then you also have a media that is struggling where Media owners in Nigeria, maybe about one or two, we can have an exception, but they are all under intense pressure to do what the government wants. So it's also a very precarious situation where people who really know what they should do. Uh, for instance, I give you a case of uh, um, a detonated bomb, uh, a, a suicide bomber, a, bomb, a suicide bombing in somewhere in a boy state. In the room for Guild of Editors, that story came and we knew the story was true. People with first with the news, they published the story. But eventually there was an intervention and all the media had to retract the story. The truth they knew that this was a suicide bomber, bomber that one, you know, the, uh, 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 event that happened. But they are all also having streaming headlines, retracting, saying, no police have said. So, it is a very, it's a very funny situation, uh, which I believe that an effective system, a system that works, will fix all of that and begin to, um, maybe there has to be a proper ombudsman where, where the media are properly regulated. self regulation of the media is what we had in the past. So that's why you can't see certain things come out from a media, uh, a medium like porn. The things that they can never take, no matter the offer you make to them. So we're looking for a time when you will have more media houses having that uh, uh, spirit or, or sincerity of purpose, focus on on the ethics of the profession. But it's not just the media. It's the same thing with the legal, uh, the justice system. The same thing with the, even the spiritual system, the churches, the mosques. This corruption is all over. This this problem is. Is endemic. So just to say it's not just my area, it's, 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 it's everywhere. But do they have a big role to play? Of course, yes. The big, big role uh, in forming the city is number one thing when it comes to this uh, 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 in any crisis, whether it's banditry, whether it's Boko uh, 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 Haram, whether it's uh, terrorism, whatever it is, the media is what everybody looks up to. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, for uh, sort of uh, taking that on the spot. Thank you. Um, we're, it's 11 o'clock uh, US Eastern time, and I believe it's um, 
time is it in Nigeria? I'm not sure. Um, but we're we're pretty much out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been a lively, vibrant uh, conversation on uh, banditry and abductions in Nigeria. Um, the, the last question in the, not the last question, there's a very interesting question that we have that we don't have time to take, but it's talking about how do we bridge the gap? How do we make things happen? How do we go from uh, the meso, the macro, uh, the grassroots level? How do we connect with politicians uh, where, you know, who make the decisions? How do we make things happen? Uh, a lot is going on, but in different spaces, uh, things are somewhat frag fragmented. How do we pull all of this together to begin to make a difference? Um, so I'll leave everyone to sort of uh, chew on that, think it through. And uh, we're looking forward to more webinars where we can uh, begin to make things more concrete and begin to make a difference. Uh, thank you for attending from wherever you've joined us. Uh, thank you to our very, very distinguished uh, members of the panel. Uh, thank you for your insights. And I'll now hand things over to the organizers. Professor Dr. Funke, I'll hand uh, things th over to you. Thank you very much to our distinguished and able and thoughtful panelists. Thank you to our extraordinarily brilliant moderator and to my fellow organizers, I thank you. Um, we are going to have another webinar in an hour. So I invite you all to please come and join us. Now I want to ask the um, panelists, this, uh, the rest of the questions that you didn't answer, if we share them with you, will you answer them so that we can disseminate your answers? Okay, I see Dr. Nobolo nodding. Maybe Dr. Sandra is also nodding. <laughs> and, yes, I am. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Abiola and our really wonderful Mary, who I confused Mary by giving her contrary yes, information, yes, yes. but she still came. So, you know, these are dynamic people. Thank you, and please, round of applause. Now, um, Nigerian Studies, Lagos Studies, APN, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think I need to add much. I think we've had um, a very rich set of presentations and discussions. I'm not surprised given the caliber of the panelists that we have in front of us who are tried, tested, experienced, and distinguished. Um, all I have to do now is just to thank our moderator. I call that distinguished. Um, and she has, uh, as always, risen up to the occasion. I also want to thank um, the Air Nigerian Studies Association and the Lagos Studies Association and uh, Professor Kume. This has been a fantastic collaboration and uh, we've had a fantastic webinar so far. But I want to invite everybody that there is still more from where this came from. And that will be in an hour's time when we have panel four, which is on gender sensitive policy solutions. So please come back, stay tuned, bring your friends and families and be part of this rich intellectual feast. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just, thank you. Oh, I, ju I just, I, sorry, uh, I just want to add that for all those people who are asking, how can we implement these things? Come to the next panel. That is where solutions will be discussed. So try and make it in an hour's time. This is this is an ad for that that panel. You you'll be satisfied when you get there because I see a lot of the comments are about solutions. Yeah, thank you so much. I can't, I don't have anything to add in terms of appreciation. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we hope that um, the attendees would join for the last, but not the least of all the winners. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Rita, Chica.
Thank you, Julie. Happy Thank to you, see everyone. you again. Thank you, Good to see you, Prof. Thank you. Same here. Everyone. <laughs> See you. Share your hope, for the next one. I hope you will all also contribute chapters to the book that we want to edit on this. Oh, there's a book coming out of it? Yes. Yeah, you know, James Corey wants to do a book with us. Oh, wow. We might use um, one of the Nigerian publishers. We're thinking of maybe Premium uh, Times. Okay. So that we'll have distribution in Nigeria and Africa. Oh, okay. Not just, yeah. So we'll I be mean, let's see how we go yeah. being touched here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay then. Yes, bye. Okay. Bye. Send me girls. You guys are winners. <laughs> yes, so absolutely. <laughs> oh, don't let me bring my own old girls. Oh. <laughs> we will win you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. Uh -uh. Who is that? I don't know. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, let me go. Oh. Uh -uh. Oh, so, that, my sister Mary, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much <laughs> for rising to the occasion. You know, that I'm a one love person. Lovely. I'm a one-person uh, promotional cook. <laughs> My research assistant has quit. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for coming. Really appreciate yeah. it. And for your thoughtful and, you know, just sound analysis. Okay, the recording is still on. Let me stop it. Um, yeah, please stop the recording. Yeah, um, you, I'm surprised that Sahid left because I wanted the three of us to, uh, four of us to talk, <sighs> you know. And we have to wait for 